Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 334, featuring Carlos Fueyo, creative director and owner of Playyard Studios. I have known Carlos for a little bit, and he is super exciting to have on. <laughs> Tell me, Kristen, what are some of the amazing things that you remember about Carlos and this awesome podcast? Well, first, I said he has quite the resume um, from Priest to Super 8 and Avengers Age of Ultron. Like, he has worked on so many amazing films. Um, and mm -hmm. from the beginning, like, he got to start off on awesome things, like, on his early career. Um, mm -hmm. And then he, I also like when he talked about his project Lair, um, he mm -hmm. goes a lot really into depth, but all the um, cinema's like most infinite, infamous sets um, from Ex Machina and James Bond, the bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, and it was all, and that was his first experience with real time. Um, I think he said, so you guys go into that and how it's kind of revolutionizing VFX. So it's just a really good podcast. You're going to be enthralled. It yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. In fact, I sort of got involved. I mean, I've known Carlos for a little bit and he and I sort of peripherally known each other for a long time, but you did get involved in this Lairs project. And the first thing that I sort of noticed, this was the first sort of interesting project that had extremely interesting use of V-Ray for Unreal uh, and the way he does things. The Lair project specifically uh, is really cool in terms of what he's done there. So that was really fascinating. But one of the things I'm going to tell you, Kristen, one of the most coolest things that happens on this podcast is you find secret things that you had no idea about when you ask people questions about how they started their career. And Carlos started his career, or one of the things he did in early in his career is he worked with Lebius Woods and that oh, yeah. is unbelievable because he is absolutely one of my absolute heroes in in the world of architecture uh and what he's created and you know in his in the kind of work he's done so it was really great to talk to carlos about libius wood so anyone in the architecture world who's interested in that should really check out uh what carlos did there because it was really fabulous uh but yeah you're right he did some really great stuff in real-time world he talks a little bit about virtual production as well and uh all of those cool things so it was really awesome to have carlos on and uh, to just, yeah, just talk about the, the cool work that he's done over at Play Art Studios. So, uh, Kristen, we have a couple of events going on. What's happening right now? Yes, um, you can find these out at chaos.com slash events. The first one will be uh, July 21st. It's a V-Ray 5 for SketchUp webinar. So you'll learn tips to accelerate your everyday workflow. Don't want to miss that. And then July 29th, we have a Tool Farm V-Ray for Cinema 4D webinar. Um, so you can just discover what's new. And then our big announcement, September 9th and 10th, we are doing 24 hours of chaos again. So it will be 12 back-to-back -back shows with more than 60 host speakers um, and guests all around the world in a 24-hour live stream. So... Exciting. That's amazing. Yes, we. Uh, it was. It was really great. I loved Twenty Four Hours of Chaos last year. It was a lot of fun. I can't believe I stayed up for a big portion of it. Believe it or not, uh, because it was so much fun. Uh, but again, I'm excited that we're doing it again this year. And then, uh, yes, the LA show will be doing a, a couple of hours as well. But all of the episodes and all of the different zones are really fun. So remember that September 9th and 10th, uh, we would love to uh, see you guys for Twenty Four Hours of Chaos. Uh, okay, cool. And we have a couple of product announcements as well. What's going on there? Yeah, so this week, uh, V-Ray 5 for Revit Update 1 became available. Um, mm -hmm. And then in the past, we've talked about it, V-Ray 5 for Cinema... Cinema 4D Update 1, um, and then V-Ray 5 for Maya and Houdini uh, Update 1 as well. Perfect. Yes, those are all the V-Ray 5 updates that have been out. The big one, obviously, is V-Ray 5 for Revit. So go check it out and go to look, find out all the new features that are out there at chaos.com. If people want to know more about the podcast, where can they go, Kristen? You can go to facebook.com slash cggaragepodcast or chaos.com slash cggarage. And if you want to watch us on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash chaosgrouptv. Perfect. And if you guys have ideas of new and other great podcasts or guests or have feedback for this show, whatever it is, let us know. Labs at chaosgroup.com is how you reach us on an email. We would love to hear from you. And of course, don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Those are always welcome. And I think that's about it. Cool. That being said, please enjoy this awesome podcast with my good friend, Carlos Fueyo. Welcome to another CG Garage. Where the chaos group talks. 
You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. All right, Carlos, finally. Finally, we've been wanting to do this for almost a few years, right? Yeah, this is a big deal. This is, uh, this is a CG garage with yeah. uh, <laughs> there's, there's always for now. But yeah. <laughs> everything yeah. has for now, you know, Mr. Everything has for now. Uh -huh. This is big, you know, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be painless. You know, it's, it's like the, you know how you have that really, uh, the, you go to the doctor's office and you have the nurse that gives you a shot and there's one that's really good and you don't right. even know you got it. That's what it'll be like. I'll be okay, the good, good nurse. It's not like the COVID <laughs> shot, right? And you get it. Yeah, you yeah. didn't feel anything. Didn't feel the a thing. the next day you're horrible. <laughs> yeah. That, that I can't guarantee. I don't know the after effects of this. Uh, <laughs> but all right, well, let's get it. Let's get a little bit. I mean, obviously I've been following a lot of the cool work you've been doing especially sort of in the in the real-time world and some of the things you've been doing there but let's figure out a little bit of your origin story so carlos tell us a little bit about what how did you start getting into cg where where does where did it all start for you it starts in architecture school mm -hmm. um, so i think you you and i have that in common um, yeah. <laughs> um i i i studied a, a fiu which is florida international university here in miami and I studied architecture, masters and bachelors, sorry, bachelors and masters. And um, really early, like design two or something like that, I started using Max, you know, mm. the, the, that was the uh, the obvious step from AutoCAD, you know, like how do yep. I make everything not look flat? Okay, Max. Um, so, you know, I started using Max and that became sort of a hobby. And I started using Max more and more and more on my free time, became an obsession, you know, to the point where my parents, you know, or like, what the hell are you doing? You know, stop wasting your time with 3D. Just start your architecture. Just finish architecture. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, I like 3D. Um, and and I started doing, you know, started by the time I was in in, in grad school, um, I was already doing rendering, like ArcVis stuff. I had a small ArcVis company. I would get like, you know, projects here and here and there. Uh, some mid-rises, high-rises. And, uh, but that wasn't enough. I, I always wanted to do it for film. And I always followed, you know, Blur, obviously, yeah. you know. So I what year followed. What year are we talking about? About which uh, We're talking about 2000, well, we're talking about between 2000, I remember architecture school, you know, this is about, mm -hmm. you know, it's an eight year ordeal. So yep. starting, around, <laughs> starting around 2001, all the way to 2000, you know. Nine or so, know. right? <laughs> yeah, 2009 yeah. or whatever. Um, and so, you know, even early on, like, you know, my 2001, 2002, you know, Blur was the place that I would go. Like, what is the coolest next? You know, like The Rock, you know, the one that they were The Rock. Mm -hmm. I forgot the name of that one. Uh, but they had all these cool shorts, right, that they would do. And that was like, you know, they were like, holy shit, well, you know, I would love to work for Blur. Mm -hmm. So far away, right? I'm still in Miami. Um, and then the other one was Joseph Kosinski. You know, it's this, mm -hmm. this, I think, and I think he was the one that, or their work, which was KD Lab at the time, uh, they're the ones that got me into, you know, okay, where well, there's there's a link between architecture and storytelling. You know, yep. it's there. They're showing it, right? So I used to follow their work. All the, I used to write them emails, which, uh, you know, I don't think I never got a reply. I get it. But, <laughs> but I used to write emails like, oh, my God, you're amazing. I want to do what you guys do. Give me some, you know, some uh, some pointers. Um, and then towards the end of, of architecture school, um, I got the chance to work with one of my heroes in architecture, which is Livius Woods, uh, who passed Seriously? away. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. So I worked with him uh, r right before he died. So a few months before he died. Oh, wow. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting story because that's when I was using... So rewind a few years, I was yeah. using Brazil. And that uh -huh. was the render engine, right? Before V-Ray came out. Yeah. And we were all waiting for Brazil 2 to come out. Of course, yeah. it took like, you know, two years for the thing to come out. And in between... You know, V-Ray came along, and that's when I started using V-Ray. Um, but in between, I was also using Maxwell Render, and mm -hmm. I forgot the other one, you know, those... Uh, Final Render, too? The, I never used Final Render. Okay. I got too scared using Final Render. Um, I heard too many... Horror, I used it for a little bit just because I wanted to get a job at 2012, but I heard too many, you know, horror stories from 2012, and I kind of stayed away from it. Right. Um, 
2012, 2012 the movie. Um, but yeah. um, so in in doing this different tests, I took one of the buildings from Livius Woods, which is the Electro Provida, Electro mm-hmm. Provida building. I don't know how you say that in, in native, you know, Eastern language, but um, it's this building that was bombed and he did this weird reconstruction of it on, on a very Livius Woods uh, deconstruction. Well, you should, manner. we should. I- any architect will know who Lubius Woods is. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. But 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 uh, but you should explain a little bit who he is because he's a fa- fascinating person. He's you know? amazing. Yeah, he's yeah. Uh, so Lubius Woods is a theoretical architect. Mm-hmm. He's 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 done only a few architectural pieces, like constructed pieces. Mm-hmm. He did one uh, before he died, which I got to work on as well, uh, which was a piece that was inserted into a building in China, which was it was a. Um, so a Stark building, I think. I think it was a Stark building. Mm. I have to, I, I, but you know, he's done a few things. But he's always been a theoretical architect, and he's been sort of. I think he started years. off as an illustrator. Like he was an illustrator for some of the big architecture firms, and then sort of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think so. Yeah. And because his and illustrations, he, he does watercolors and amazing. pencil drawings, sort of beautiful oh, drawings. Beautiful stuff. Yeah. If you got, if 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 anyone listening hasn't seen, you know, just Google Libius Woods, and you know, the world will open in front of you in terms of like, you know. The concepts that this guy had yeah. were, were just just mind blowing. In and fact, he, was, he won. He won. A, and, and this is interesting because it comes back to a little bit of what we're going to get into. You. He won a lawsuit, I believe, of an undisclosed uh, yeah, no, amount. No, yeah, actually, he told me the story because I had to ask him about it. Okay, tell me the tell tell me. Uh, <laughs> you, you tell the story. <laughs> the uh, the uh, so the, so he's in a way he's the muse of 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 um, Frank Gehry. Right. And, you know, and, and, and Sahadi and all these, you know, even Calatrava, all these architects that looked at his work, you know, for inspiration because he never really built anything, but mm-hmm. inspirational he's you know, and, and, and theoretically he has this beautiful theory about deconstruction, which, you know, I could nerd out all, all day long on. Mm-hmm. I consider myself a deconstructist or throughout, uh, throughout architecture school. So I, you know, I love the guy. So I did this project mm-hmm. that was a reconstruction of his, one of his designs, but he only had designed half of it. I designed the other half. I put it online on YouTube. He contacted me like a month later, like, holy shit, I want to meet you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, thank you for doing this. I went up to New York. I met him. And then we were going to, he wanted me to work with him on some stuff. And then, you know, the, we worked a little bit on the China project that I helped him visualize some of the, uh, the renderings. And then he passed away, short, uh, um, you know, short after. But um, the story with uh, the movie is um, uh, 12 Monkeys. And and I asked him about it, you know, because there's this scene in Twelve Monkeys where I forgot the name of the character. He gets Bruce Willis's uh, character. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bruce Willis's character. He's he's on this chair that is, it's it's elevated in a wall. You know, he's he's sort of in the middle of the wall, and there's this big camera in front of him, and you know they're interrogating him, and this this big cam- probe is you know camera is probing him, and he said that you know he loved Terry Gilliam's work, so one day he went to the movie theater, sat down, went with his wife, and they started watching the movie. And he got to that scene, and he's like, wait, that's... It's an exact that's, that's rip-off. Of, <laughs> it's an exact rip-off of a, of a drawing by Livia yeah. Sweats. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's, I designed that years ago. What's, what's going on here? So he left the theater, and he, he, he sued the, the... Who's the studio? Was that Warner Brothers? or I don't remember who the studio was, but he I, I the heard studio. they settled for an undisclosed <laughs> amount. But They, they yeah. did settle. Yeah, they, had, they pulled the movie from... from from circulation until they settle. So like them, I know they lost some money. And and if you look at the scene and you look at the sketch, I mean they're it's that, identical. <laughs> that art director, that the production designer like really did not leave much no. for the imagination. <laughs> Even the camera angle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But and the interesting thing with him too is that he he was sort of the other missing part, which was here's someone who's a renowned theoretical architect. Who has he's he's on top of his game, you know. I mean, he's, he's the best of the best when it comes to what he does. Yeah. But there was always this connection that he wanted to have to film, because he had that twelve monkey connection. But he also, at one point, he was in talks to do, and he did some of the work. He he did concept work for aliens, not the aliens that we got, but the environment alien that really Scott was going to. He was going to do oh. the second part instead of instead of Cameron doing it. Uh, and this, that's the way I understand it. Mm-hmm. And he had, and he was supposed to be like this big city, I guess more like Prometheus sort of mm-hmm. world. Uh, and he had designed all these things. So he wanted to get into film. So once again, there was that, that, that strong connection between architecture and film and storytelling. Um, and um, I'll make the rest 
the the rest is short. I mean, I, I work with uh, someone that we know. I mean, I, I worked at this place where I met a lot of great artists who are some of them are still very dear friends of mine. One of them was uh, Alex Nice. Oh um, yeah, Alex, of nice. course. Uh, he's one of my best friends. You know, we've been really good friends for 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 over a decade. Um, and he uh, he got me a job at or he got me an interview at um, at Svengali VFX. And at that time, I didn't have a reel, so I created all this work, put it all together. You know, like I made up like different things that I was able to put into a reel. And I got interviewed by Mr. Niederhorst himself. Right. And um, and I that was my first job. That's when uh, that's how I, that's how I got into film. Thanks to Alex. Right. And that was nice. a great team. That was Mike Oakley was on that team. Yep. Um, uh, God, I know all these people. <laughs> yeah. For, yeah. 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 Uh, well. Yeah. Uh, 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 Rob was on the team, and then right. you had uh, Kramer, was right? On that team, yep. I mean, it's, it was a, it was a, it was a huge. I mean, great, great, amazing team. Uh, a great uh, introduction to the right. To the, but Rob to the, also had a connection to architecture, and so does Alex. Not really directly, but Alex definitely has an influence in that area. So all of those people understood the language that you were talking about, probably. Right. No, it was great, and and it was a, a perfect. It couldn't be a more perfect job. It was priest. And uh -huh. it was this scene in Priest where they were going to do matte painting for, for extending the buildings. Mm -hmm. So I get in there as, as, a, as a CG generalist, and they're like, oh, you know, we, we got to do this in 3D. And that was just creating a, a, a kit bash of, you know, of different parts of the buildings and, and, and create a narrative based on architecture in a way, that, you know, like the constructivism, like, you yep. know, buildings pieced off all over, all over the building. So it was, it was a huge, it was a great uh, uh, gateway to the film for me. Right. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So that's cool. So I didn't I didn't realize that that's when you started as on Priest. And I remember that time, it was pretty interesting. That was Rob was sort of, I, I guess he had just uh, moved a, a, away from uh, Speed Shape. So that was one of the first things that he was doing, right? Right. And so he yes. had Alex and Mike Oakley and all those guys. So yeah, I know yeah, all those. Yeah. All those dudes, it's all the usual suspects. Uh, right, I think yeah. Mike's over in Seattle these days. Yes, so. uh, I heard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I follow him a couple, uh, um, I don't think, I follow him on, on Instagram and stuff. He posts like beautiful right. boat, you know. And, he's into boats now, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into fly fishing boat. and he's into boats for sure. <laughs> right, <yes. laughs> uh, which is cool. All right, so that was your first film. Uh, yeah. and, then, and then sort of, you know, what happens around that? So did you come to LA at that point? Were you in I, LA? I was driving back and forth. Oh, so wow. I drove like, I did cross country driving like four times. And then after Priest, uh, my wife and I decided to move out to LA. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, when I got a job with... Um, uh, Scanline. Oh, okay. And, yeah. yeah. And that was another great job, um, which was uh, Super 8. Oh, um, I love it that. Was, yeah, it was, it was a great movie. And and we were tasked with um, with creating the uh, the explosion, you know, the train. The, the train, right? yeah. So right? were you working with Greg Sedillas too? Yeah. So the team was amazing. It was Greg Sedillas. It, yeah. was, uh, it was Justin Migel, you know, who, uh -huh. yeah, he's, he's no longer with us. Um, yeah. It was... Um, uh, Tony, well, uh, Chris Ledoux was the uh, comp supervisor yep. on that show. So, you know, the, it, was just, it, it was a great team as well. And I got lucky. I, brought, I was brought in and I, I got lucky to be the, the lead for, for the uh, sequence for lighting and for look dev. And it was at the time when ILM was not... So we were not working on the movie until okay. the end, meaning that no one knew that we were working on the movie because we were a vendor. So right. it was one of those interesting things where we will be, you know, it was uh, the the VFX supervisor for ILM was uh, um, yeah it was uh, 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 what's his name uh, Dennis Muren wasn't it yeah, Dennis, Dennis Muren yeah. correct right. so you know but we couldn't you know we necessarily didn't talk directly to him because yep you, you know, went through the vendor it went through, <laughs> right, exactly and then yep. at the very end they were very happy with him they're like okay fine you get credit so you know everything and that's I think that's when it became more normalized for uh, for them to use vendors. For some of yes. the sequences, yep. <clears throat> and that was an, that was an amazing show. That's where, I, you know, in real like it was, you know, it was amazing. Yeah, to be able and to that, that that the train crash sequence is like the pinnacle VFX sequence. I hate to say it, but it is the most it, important I love, scene. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's so cool. Yeah, it was so cool to work on. It was such a great team. Yeah, I mean, I remember the the amount of work that went into that. Yep. You know, I remember Justin spending days on end, you know, trying to figure out the deformations on the train and how the trains deform. And, you know, you had, um, uh, we had, um, 
I can't remember the the the, the, the FX artist, um, Joe Joe uh, Joe Scar. Oh, Joe Scar, yeah, was the uh, the FX artist. I mean, that guy that guy was a beast, you know, even back then. Yeah. I mean, he's 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 a legend. So yeah, so it was uh, yeah, it was it was such so much great great work went into that. So many late nights as well, but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it was it was absolutely gorgeous. So that's not bad. You got a good run going there, Carlos. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been really lucky, and then from there, yeah. I mean, I've been <laughs> I've been a uh, I've been a wandering uh, butterfly, you know, okay. in the VFX industry from studio to studio. I work with many people that you know, you know as well. I work with uh, Connor Meekin for many oh, years. Oh yeah, Connor. Yeah, you know, relevant VFX. You know, did some some great projects there as well. Uh, MPC, Frame Store, um, Blur. That was mm-hmm. that's probably the one that. That's you the know, one you've always wanted. That's what that's it started one, your ambition, like, right? If I wore a blur, I can retire, right? But uh, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was <coughs> blur was great. I worked there a, a few times. Uh, one of the times I got to work on a project by Kaczynski, which was uh, uh, Assassin's Creed. Uh, uh, oh yeah, that he did. You know, so that's like two check boxes right there. You yep. know, uh, and blur. You know, you know, it's 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 such an amazing studio. Uh, Tim yeah. Miller is a great. You know, I mean, everyone there is, is amazing. Sure. So, yeah, and that was for the Halo as well, the Halo um, cinematics. Right. Oh, those were huge. It was huge. Yeah. yeah. There was like 300 and something people working on it. Yep. It's, it, it was insane. Yeah, because it was like 30 minutes of stuff, wasn't it? It was enormous amount. It was amount. more. I think it, was it was almost like, like an hour. hour. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, the cu- all the cutscenes. Yeah. Yeah. Every um, single one. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've been going back and forth, you know, for different studios. And a few years ago, we decided to move back to Miami to be close to family. Mm-hmm. We have uh, three small children that were born in LA, mm-hmm. and uh, you know my wife's from here, from Miami. My parents are, you know, my my mom's in Spain, so it was it was like okay, let's go back to for now, so the kids, so that our kids can grow up with family. Sure, and and that's where we've been for the past three years. So it's okay. been sort of a new chapter. Yeah, which is great. So how how do you do that? Because <laughs> some people want to know how to make that happen. You know, a lot of people have moved out and they've uprooted themselves. And then I've heard of a lot, several people sort of moving out of LA and still able to make those connections happen, right? Still right. allow them to work on things, change or manipulate the way they think about their business or about what they do and allow you to be able to 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 not necessarily be in LA or Vancouver or London or, you know wherever the visual effects industry is, but also managed to do what you do. So what, what, what's your secret? What, how you made it, how did you guys make it work? It, it wasn't, I don't, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure I've been able to make it work still. I think okay. you know, I just got lucky, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, luck has a lot to do with everything, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, we moved out and the first, the first thing was like, oh, let's open up a small boutique studio in Miami and use the knowledge that I have to sort of serve the local market. Right. Okay. There's no local market. Um, so, <laughs> so that when, you know, we try for a year. Um, mm-hmm. There's some projects here and there that you can get, but, it, you know, budgets are really low. Yeah, South small American commercials market. for duck car dealers and stuff like that. It's probably not even. We couldn't even get to that. You know, we were wow. even too expensive for that. You know, it's like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 so, so like the budgets are so low. Then you have the South American market. It's a, it's a much different way of doing business, right? Yep. Um, so... We started getting frustrated. And when I say we, I mean my wife and I. She's a mm-hmm. producer. I'm, I, I create whatever I can. Mm-hmm. And and we just we one day talking to Alex. You know, again, you know, Alex is like this is uh, he's like my 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 conscience always telling me what to do and mm-hmm. where to go. Um, or my manager depends. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, one day talking to him, you know, he was doing this great work for um, uh, John Wick. Yeah, you know, John Wick and, three. John Wick 3, yeah, and he all he did like all these, you know, VR stuff. And he was like, Oh man, you have to get into VR. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, the VR, like it's not, I'm not sold into it. And that's when um we got this project for a book, which was Lair. And it's a book about these 16 villain layers yes. that an architect in Miami wanted to do. Um Okay. And and the story with that one is that they call me. It was through. Uh, I'm still. I have, still have a lot of relationship with the, my 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 alma mater, my my school. Mm-hmm. And one of the directors was like, was hey, we have this architect. They want to do a book about film and architecture. Why don't you go talk to them? So I went. That's to That's perfect office. fit for you, <laughs> right? So I went to their office and I'm like, okay, what do you guys got? They show me some drawings and they were like, the drawings didn't make any sense. They were they were done by a graphic artist. So the graphic artist in Illustrator was only doing 
what he knew how to do, right? Right. So we told him, listen, we want to take this as a project, as sort of a passion project. Doesn't matter the budget that you have. They have very little budget. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll take it. So it was 16 houses or 16 layers. Of yeah. Just like three or four James Bond, Ex Machina, yeah. um, Star Blade Wars. Runners. Blade Runner 2048. Blade Runner 2048 was there. Doctor Strange uh, Love. Doctor Strange Love. Yeah. Yeah. Some some great movies. And yeah. in a matter of three months, I had to model every single one of those spaces. So I had right. to watch every movie. Some of them I've seen many times. But yeah. frame by frame, try to trying to deconstruct, which was really fun, try to deconstruct, okay, how do these how are these rooms built? So I can mm-hmm. build them in 3D and mm-hmm. then using a toon shader, render them as if they were uh uh, construction drawings. Right. But then that meant that I have both. I could do perspectives and I can do construction drawings. So in total, it was 120 uh, original illustrations that we did. Mm-hmm. And then we did, that's when I was talking to Alex and I'm like, well, let me try doing three of these as a VR experience. And that's the first time I use Unreal. So mm. I did it, came out great. Then client came back and said, oh, can we do a commercial? I'm like, oh, you guys have no money, but let me see what I can do. And we took Unreal and we did this commercial that took you through three of the, the, the uh, you know, the, the three that I did for the, the VR. Mm-hmm. It, it took you through all three of them. And we were able to do that like in less, like in two weeks or three weeks because right. we already had the content. Because you already had it all done. done. Yep. And, and it was, and that sort of started opening the, the, the door into Unreal. Like that's what allowed me to learn Unreal because I had never right. used Unreal until then. Um, so that's so that's that started this obsession with learning Unreal. And well, learning. you were the first you were the first person that I remember, and you know this. When was that that layer thing came out? What, what three years ago? Maybe four years ago? There was uh, November of twenty nineteen, I think. Yeah, November okay. twenty nineteen. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, it was the first time I had seen uh, uh, someone do and and do, you know. A, a substantial job using V-Ray for Unreal to bake out a lot of the lighting. So yes, I saw that right. the, the Ex Machina piece was uh, uh, like the, the lighting looked amazing. And I was like, I haven't seen lighting look like this in an uh, Unreal project yet. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and, and it, actually that's, you're reminding me that's the, for that project, the, the big thing that helped me learn Unreal was V-Ray for Unreal. Okay. Because, Why is that? <clears throat> well, because I, you, you know, using Unreal for, I mean, using V-Ray for so long, you, you're, you're familiar with it. Mm-hmm. So you get to work on Maya and then export everything into Unreal. You, you kind of like that whole fear of, okay, how do I put this in together in Unreal? That, that goes out the window. You can, it gives you more time sure. to pick it up, right? You can start doing things quicker. But then the shaders, you know, I didn't understand the shaders in Unreal at the beginning. Right. But I could do the shaders in V-Ray. Mm-hmm. Throw them into Unreal, and then I will get an idea of how these things are built. Lighting the same way, right. um, and then the baking. Yeah, but the baking was done with V-Ray, and mm-hmm. I, now I know that the ba- that the light would not look the same way if I had right. done CPU bake. Um, right. But the fact that I use you know V-Ray, for, it just gave me the V-Ray look uh, within Unreal, which was you know no ray trace because this was before RTX. Right. Um, so it was, you know, it, it was it was really a, a godsend for me um, on on that at that time specifically. Yeah, it was nice to see that because we were still like, you know, trying to figure out how what people could do, and it, it came, along came this project, and it looks really really cool. Can people actually check it out? Is it available on on different yeah. VR stores or stuff like that? Where, where uh, not, not the VR, not the VR experiences. Um, okay. The the um, the VR experiences, they're on our website, player studios, playyourstudios.com. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have a section where we have the three. It's uh, Doctor Strange Love, Ex Machina, and Blade Runner 2048. Mm-hmm. And then the, the spot that we did is also in there, uh, in, in the same website. The video is, yeah. The, the video, yeah, which is like a one-minute video that, that so was sort of, um, they used it to unveil the project in New York and some other places as well. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Uh, well, cool. Okay, so so you had the you had the uh, the project. Uh, uh, so tell us a little bit more about you know what 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 went on from there. So how you started to get into VR at this point. Like VR is like okay, not, I, not <laughs> VR. I, I still put VR to the side. Oh, okay. Then, but yeah, it's more it's, about the Unreal or about the real more, time. It was, yeah, it was more about you know I'm in Miami. I'm I'm trying to get some work. 
Yeah. Like, is there really a way that I could like create production quality work without having to have, you know, a rendering farm or, mm -hmm. you know, tons of budget? Because no one here is going to give me the budget. Right. So we did a couple more projects. I did one more with V-Ray uh, for Unreal, which was this ex this quick test of a car. It was called Exodus. It's a car, uh, an Audi, um, I forgot the model, one of those concept cars going down this desert road. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, we did another three or four. Uh, and it was all done. It was, it was all trying. It, it was all testing. It was all uh, spec work mm -hmm. on, okay, can I get production quality renders from, from this pipeline? Right. Um, and then along came uh, the Wilsonian Museum, which is a museum here in Miami, mm -hmm. um, which came to us, even though they knew that we were not ArcVis, um, they came to us to help them uh, visualize some of the interior spaces and help them design some of the interior spaces. And towards the end of the, this was just images, uh, but it was really interesting because even though we're images, we would have these calls with them on Zoom. This was already during the pandemic, where they would be on Zoom and they would, we will be designing everything on Unreal. Hmm. So that started showing me, okay, there is a way that you can bring in the client. This, this, it's more than just about the rendering. It's about the process and, you know, what real time brings to the table, which is, it's for everyone, for the client as well, right? Right. Um, and then towards the end, we told them, listen, if your guys ever want to do an animation, you know, we would, look, we would love to do something cool with this. A few months went by and then they called us and said, okay, let's do the animation. So hmm. we did this piece called uh, Artful Future, which was a way of showcasing this, I don't know, how many thousand square foot extension. But since they didn't have a design yet, uh, they said, okay, can, can we do it any other way? So we told the story through the pieces that they're thinking about putting on the extension. So all these pieces that they're, they're in storage, they're not accessible. Right. So we had to model everything from photographs. I uh, want to say we, me, because that was, it was only me and my wife on that one. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, model everything from photographs uh, and then create the narrative and then render it and hope that we would be able to get, you know, a good enough quality that it could be given to a client. Because at this point, it's not just a spec spot. It's something that you're giving to a client, right? So it has to it has to meet X amount of, at least from our point of view, X X amount of, of quality. Um, we use Substance for all the text train. It's the first time using Substance on that project. I've been married, my Mari guy for 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 a really long time. Mm -hmm. And so then that started opening, you know, more windows and doors within my brain. I'm like, okay, this could actually work. Um, and uh, and. From that, I started on a short call, Replica, yeah, um, which is something that we've been working since last November. Spotty, because I also this was more of a, a, a it's it's a passion project, um, but we for, we were fortunate to get an epic grant, epic mega grant on that. Nice. Um, so you know we've been working here and there. We're trying to finish it by September, um, and uh, and that's and that's farther, you know, allowing me to you know, figure out this whole and real thing and, 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 and final pixel. Cause my whole thing is final pixel, you know, it's, right. can you get production quality out of, out of this environment, whether it's unreal or V-Ray or, you know, any other, like, you know, real time's the future, right? It's right. It's, it's, it's what's going to be right. used. So, so that's, that's been sort of the, the path of the past two couple of years. Um, okay. And it's been interesting. It's, it's been fun. Well, tell us a little bit about the about that that short you're working on because that's a really cool one. You showed me some teasers and uh, you know of it and a little bit of behind the scenes as well, which are really cool. But tell, tell oh, people thanks. a little bit about what it's about and 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 how you what what you're trying to say in the story. So the short is it's about 15 minutes. Uh, we have a, a script, um, and we already have some. You know, we have a few people working on it, but mainly myself. I'm, I'm for now. I'm doing all the the digital work. Um, yep. It's it's a sci-fi um, short about yep. this astronaut that finds this mysterious object in the sky, or oh, sorry, next to their you know in, in space next to their ship, the ship, and goes out to investigate. And you know there is a sort of a twist at the end, you know of of of, um, of what the culmination of this interaction is. And it's a it's part of a forced uh, forced short stories that are sort of based on the same. Um, uh, a galaxy, or sorry, the same um, universe. 
Mm -hmm. And this is the first one of those stories. And each story kind of takes a, takes a slice at what happens from this first one to the fourth one. It's sort of like a timeline between Earth and another planet. Um, but the interesting thing is how whole, the whole thing started, um, which is this, this really interesting thing with real time that you no longer, it's, it's freeing in a way. It's sort of like, I mean, you and I have been, you know, you've been doing this for way longer than me, but you know, like my, like my thing has always been, I want to tell stories, right? But I can't because I have a technological limitation where I am supposed to do things in this very specific order, yep. right? And I'm going to get to a point where unless I have rendering power, I won't be able to tell this story. I won't, I won't be able to have a finished product. I could tell the story, but I wouldn't be able to have like a finished product, like the one that I have in my head. Okay, this is going to be pristine, beautiful. It's going to look like a blur cinematic, whatever, right? Um, with this short, it started with a planet. And I have this planet. I go, this could be a cool thing, planet. You know, I'll put a spaceship on it. And then he started growing. And then from a planet, he turned into a story. But that's because I, I can, and this is the same with all the other spec work that, that I've done in Unreal. You can create your sets, make them as realistic as you can, and then grab a camera and start shooting and start telling a story. And there's no, there's no delay between you shooting and then rendering it out. It's just, it's just a few minutes away, right? And right. then you can start editing and you can edit on the go. Oh, I don't like this. Let me re-render this whole shot. So it becomes this very, I hate using the word organic too freely, but it's, it's this very organic process where you can start with something very minuscule and start drafting a story out of it and start telling a story as you could, like, you know, if you had a set. Okay, these are my constraints. This is my set. The camera's here. Oh, this doesn't look good. Let me move the camera over here. Let me change mm -hmm. the light, right? So it becomes this beautiful iterative process. And that's how the short, in a way, was, was born. And then he sort of developed into a bigger thing. It's interesting the way you say, you talk about that, because I think it's right. You, because you are constantly able to shoot no matter what, uh, you don't have to say, okay, I have to dedicate some time to rendering. Like, let's yep. see how it looks when it's rendered. When you right. do that, um, you, when it is in real time, basically what you do is you, it's, it's like free rendering, right? So in a sense, you're, you're not afraid to try things because you can just try it again and it's, it's the same effort, right? As you're as right. just trying. And so the way that I, that I've been thinking about it is like, do you remember back when cameras were film cameras, right? Right. And you had yeah. a certain amount of film that you could have in a camera mm -hmm. and you wouldn't take a picture unless you were sure that you would get it right. Cause you didn't want to waste film. <laughs> right or whatever right. it was or you like you didn't you only had so many rolls on you or whatever it was right but when you got a digital camera it didn't matter it didn't matter yes you just kept shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and you could fill up there like the disc you know you could have thousands and thousands of pictures and you would have one picture that was usable but you tried every option yes uh, and so i think that's the way that you're describing that's great, real time great way. that's a uh, thing yeah that's a great way to say yeah um, and I think that's what it is, right? Because, and, and I think when you, when you were describing, you know, before there's a certain process that you do things, and this yep. is something I've heard from a lot of people in sort of the, in the real time world. And, you know, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. There is, there is a, a, a process, a workflow process called a waterfall approach, which is like, this happens production or you know, pre-production, production, production, post-production, right? And you can't do one until you get the other stuff done. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, with real time, you can just keep going. It just doesn't matter. You can you can start shooting with a box. <laughs> right? Yeah, it could be anything. It could be a light. Yeah, I mean, you know, we did the 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 last. We did a character study, uh, which for one of the robots for the short. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do a turntable. I have my turntable environment for Unreal. Um, and I'm like, well, why am I doing a turntable? I have the robot here. I have some lights. I have a background. I just do like a short commercial piece on it. Like if it was a fake commercial right. and that took, you know, it was, it was from an instant from like, I'm going to do this because this is the way, you know, I need to do a turntable to make sure that everything looks okay to wait. Why do a turntable? I can do a whole spot on it. 
Right. You know, and I can change a camera. And within, the same you know, thing. It's like when you hire an actor and you put them in some clothes, you don't ask them to turn around on a turntable to see if they look right. good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you look at the actions, right? So you say, look, act it out. Let's see how it looks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't like that. Well, let's take that out. You know, let's change the light. You know, okay, yeah. It's, it's you know, I mean, let me preface everything also by, I got extremely, extremely lucky that, you know, uh, yeah. Lon, who, you know, yeah. you know very well, uh, Lon yep. introduced me to George Matos from from Nvidia. Yes, uh, yes. In around November, actually uh, the beginning of 2020. Yep. And uh, and 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 George sent over you know a couple of uh, uh, graphics cards. He sent a six thousand and an eight thousand. Without that, there's you know, and I've told George this many times. Without that support, there's nothing that I've you couldn't do anything, right? So so. You know, I just want to acknowledge that 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 you know that there is you know there was a lot of support from Nvidia, and then later on from from Lenovo, from uh, some uh, um, Rob Hoffman, <laughs> Rob Hoffman, you know, who, yeah. who who very graciously you know provided a workstation, an amazing six hundred and twenty workstation. Yep. You know, the 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 technology is getting there, but you know we still need this. You know, and I'm I'm amazed that you know companies like that support artists because you know. None of the stuff that I've, none of the stuff I would have been able to do without without their support. So I just want to preface that, you know, because I, I to me that's to me well, to me that meant the world. I think that's important. I'm going to tell you know, obviously speaking for a company that does do these types of things and helps people, including you know, interviewing you and stuff like that. But there's there is there is there, there is an interest, right? We, we when when a company and I work very closely with Lenovo and Nvidia, as you know well, um, and, uh, and, and many others as well. But uh, there's a thing when, they, when the company comes together and someone like Lon says, I have identified something special. <laughs> and they identify as like, this is a, someone who has a clear view of the future of, uh, of uh, real time with a specific sensibility of quality and uh, architecture and film. And uh, uh, that's going to resonate with people. And they're like, we want to support that because we know that if people people like you can showcase what's possible, other people are going to want to do the same thing. So right. yeah, it's easy. It's an easy sell for us. <laughs> right. but, but, you know, but it still is, you know, it's, it's, it's refreshing too when you see that, you know, because yeah. the other thing about real time, which is, I don't know if maybe you'll agree with this, but when I started using Unreal, when I started mm -hmm. using, you know, even V-Ray for Unreal, there was sort of a, a, a throwback to the beginning of when I yeah. started doing CG. You know, it was a, you know, it was this it's called this, re rasterized rendering. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not 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 so much not technology wise, but you know, psychologically, there was this okay. like all of a sudden I'm like I'm learning something completely new, and I'm working in a way that is very similar to the way I was working before. Oh, it I felt refreshing. It, yeah, yeah. It felt, ref but it also felt like you know we, we've. I think we've gotten so used to um, physical, physically correct everything, where you know we got we get to a point, we got to a point where you know it's like is that that light is there, you put the light on and it falls the way it needs to fall off and mm -hmm. that's it, just leave it. The yep. reflections are everything's physically correct. You know back. Before GI, you know, you used to have to put, you know, negative spotlights on place. You have to yep. play every trick on the book in order to get the quality that you wanted. And in a way, now since you know this technology is new, you 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 kind of have to resort back to all those dirty tricks in some areas. You know, yep. it's not everything's not just clear and cut. Put a light, that's it, right? There's 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 artistically you you get to be a little more challenged, uh, which I haven't hadn't felt in a, in a while. Uh, hmm. until then yeah it's interesting because i i kind of part of me wants to accelerate I, I want to get back to the point where i get the best of both worlds honestly because right. i think that there's definitely you know the, i it's it's the you know vlado and i've been talking about this for a while it's like will rendering will offline will sorry will real-time rendering replace offline rendering yes and that's happening now for sure but one thing is for sure is rasterized rendering will not replace ray tracing. Eventually, it's going to be fully ray traced and real time, right? Because right. I don't, th I think rasterized rendering is there, and it's it is great because it's fast. But it's not like the reason we moved to ray tracing wasn't necessarily because it was slower, and it wasn't necessarily because it was more accurate. 
we moved to ray tracing because you didn't have to make all these, you didn't have to take so long to get those decisions to be made. You didn't have right. to put negative lights there. It will just yep. happen naturally, right? And so, so uh, it was much simpler to light, even though it took longer to render. So I think that's, for me, I want a little bit of both. And I agree. I think, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know. Uh, I'm looking at, you know, I've tried to compare the world of, uh, uh, of, raster, or of real-time rendering and where it lies in the level of history of offline rendering when it was still rasterized, Right. Right. Uh, and so I looking at currently, you know, like unreal five is out now and everyone's talking about how excited they are about nanite and, and lumens and all that stuff, which is interesting. Uh, <laughs> it is. but, but I look <laughs> at, I look at, you want to. <laughs> no, we can, we can absolutely. And I, I do want to talk about it, but here's the point I'm trying to make is basically there was a point, right? What's exciting about what's interesting about, uh, nanite is that you can get a huge amount of geometry in the scene, yeah. right? Which is something that's not possible with, normal rasterized rendering completely possible with full ray tracing because of the way ray tracing works with its accelerating structure you can get way more you can get billions and billions of polygons with with, with rasterized with ray tracing with full ray tracing but you can't do that so they create this system called nanites and what's interesting about it is if i looked at it i was kind of trying to understand what it is and this is you know, maybe wrong but this is how i feel it is it's based on the similar system that uh, Pixar had way back in the what day called brick maps, right? And it allows it to sort of make voxelized areas of pixels in certain ways, which involves a huge amount of cash that you have to develop, but you still have it available. And the first time that 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 uh, you know brick maps were around, that were showcased or you've seen them, was actually on the film Wall-E when they created these giant. Right trash piles right and so i was like okay so my feeling is right now rasterized rendering is at the wally -E level like we've got wally -E now right <laughs> and then we're eventually going to move along and i mean if you look at what happened with with, with pixar they kept rasterized rendering for about as long as you humanly could before they said, okay, now we have to give it up and go full yeah, ray tracing yep. and 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 now that's what it is i think well, eventually a couple years ago, right or once, uh, yeah, when, or maybe or six or maybe six or seven years ago, but but in any case, it's that's that's where we're going to end up happening, right? We have to, you know, they had probably one of the best offline rasterizers around. Well, isn't um, it, it's kind of what which I'm still playing with it, but sort of the omniverse, right? The Nvidia omniverse, uh, omniverse, mm -hmm. where they have they have the two engines you can do. You can do raster, or you can. You can, you can, do, you uh, can. but I mean, technically, when people say ray tracing in like video games, it's not really ray tracing. It's rasterized rendering with ray tracing on top. It's the same right. hack we used to use when we were in the early days of Max. You know, when you're like, ah, just add ray tracing only when necessary. <laughs> you know, for right. like some yeah. reflection or something like that, because that's that's the all you could afford in terms of render time. Um, yeah. But eventually, it's going to go all ray tracing. You know. Uh, what I think is fascinating about the Unreal thing is that, uh, and I think people seem to forget about it a little bit, Unreal is not just a renderer. <laughs> Unreal <Yep>. is a system. <laughs> yep. You can do a lot in it, you know? Renderers don't do motion capture. <laughs> nope. So you can do yeah. you, you can do motion capture, right? And I think what's interesting is they've picked up a they've picked up a, a an interesting piece of the 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 idea of like, hey, you know, it's not just for games. There's a lot of people that use this technology for a lot of different things. So it's kind of a fascinating thing uh, where where real time technology is going, and it's not obviously Unreal as one. Unity is also looking at stuff, and we're also uh, very very yeah, interested. You guys in have, yeah, you guys. Yeah. Advantage, yeah. but you know, we we've already dedicated our, our our settings. Like we're we're looking at real time, but we're looking at it fully ray traced. And that's what our, right. is of interest to us. So, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go on that rant, but I, I'm curious. No, no, like, no. what it's, what it's is a your bright, what, it's a bright future? Yeah, it is a bright future. <laughs> well, I hope it's a bright future. It's definitely a yeah. faster future. Uh, <laughs> and, like uh, like David Lynch put a song, you know, the, you know the, I've seen the video of, uh, I think it's one of his weather reports that he does every day, David Lynch. Oh, I love it. And one of them, he has his sunglasses. Like, I'm wearing sunglasses today because the future looks bright. <laughs> you know, <it's> a, <laughs> if, you guys, if you guys haven't seen it, uh, uh, David Lynch does the Los Angeles weather report every day on YouTube and you just go to him and amazing. he'll read the weather to you. And it's, it's amazing. The most David Lynch thing you can ever imagine. If, uh, if COVID like if COVID would have, like, let's say, if, you know, if studios would have been around for the past year, that would have been the best thing to put on a big, 
flat screen TV yeah. in the middle of the office so that as you walk in the door, like that's the first thing you see. I mean, today we're looking at beautiful blue skies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's, he's so yeah. cool. He's, he's so great. cool. He's uh, okay. Well, tell me. All right. So now, now that, you know, we've established the excitement of real time and you've shown us, you know, your, your, your journey through that area. What, what is, what is your feelings about it? What do you see the, the future for you? You've obviously, you know, you've been identified as someone, you know, through Lenovo and NVIDIA and ourselves as someone who's having a clear look at the, at the beautiful uh, version of real time. What do you see as the future? What do you, or what do you want to see out of it? I, I don't know what to expect. I guess that's the bit, that's the best, you know, so the whole Plato was the Plato Socrates, you know, all I know is that I know nothing. Um, <laughs> and I've, I've, trust me, I, I wasn't always like that. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh but I've, i'm i'm uh, you know it's it's i don't know what to expect other than just for it to get better and yeah for it to allow us to do more whether it's unreal or omniverse or v-ray you know which, which whichever platform i think is going to be isn't going to be one right it's, it's not going to be a monopoly i don't think um but i do think there's a lot of work that needs to be you know it's it's not there yet in many ways right um i, I do feel you know I mean, I feel in awe every time I like, you know, you go to LinkedIn and you go to, you know, any platform and, and art station and you see this beautiful imagery that is being created by single artists, like, you know, like a, a guy or a girl with a computer and a Vita card. And they're creating mm -hmm. these masterful pieces that, you know, a few years ago you couldn't do without, you know, money. Uh, right. So I think it's opening up a huge door for content creation for people who are not able to create content before. And I think to me that's, you know, that right there, it should be enough, right? Um, sure. But there is also a hype that I'm not sure where that's going to go. And that's sort of the, not in a negative way, but that's sort of a lot of the thinking that I've been doing, you know, internally for the past, especially for the past year, is we have this tool that everyone's using. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry if you hear my kids in the background, okay. they just decided to like storm into the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they are the... The, the challenges of working from home. The, um, yeah. There's this new platform and there's all these new resources available. And at the beginning, I, you know, you go into it with like this, oh, you know, oh my God, I can do all this. But for some reason, I feel like maybe everyone's jumping on, I feel like everyone's relying too much on what's there. And that's where I don't know if I'm being negative or not, but you know, it's it worries me a lot, a little bit that that everyone's testing things that are not, you know, like they're. I feel like people are creating but not creating at the same time. They're mm. creating, but they're using mega scans or they're using right. library content or they're using, you know, it's, it's almost like a clip art. It's almost like a new clip art, right? Right. And and that's great because it's amazing because that allows you to to experiment, but then you need to realize that, you know, that's only a portion of the story. The big story comes in when you need to do something, you know, one-off, when you need to do something specific to a client, right? Or because that, right. that's when the real challenges come in. Yep. Um, and, and that scares me not so much because, you know, people will learn, but because I don't, also I don't see education resources that are, I feel like education is not catching up to that either. So you don't have universities. I don't see universities, you know, teaching on real engine or, or blending, you know, creating some sort of like, uh, interdisciplinary program where you have, right. uh, you know, unreal engine blend into architecture and art, you know, yeah. so that as you, do this, you know, you're learning about art, you're learning about things that will allow you to create beyond, you know, the, uh, the store. Hold on one second. Sure. <laughs> so this is going to be the, 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 the blooper on the, uh, guys, I need you to please. Okay? <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. You can come say hello and then you can leave. You want to do that? Yeah. Okay. There you go. All this right. Here we go. All right. <laughs> this is Eli. Hi, Eli. You're on a podcast. Okay. You're on the podcast. You're in the CG, <laughs> CG garage. Up, up. And then this one's here is the bigger one, Ian. Oh, my gosh. Big yeah. guy. 
Hi, Ian. Okay. Welcome Hi. to CG Garage. <laughs> go and close the door. There you go. So, so I, I do feel like the, the, you know we need to. There, there is sort of this void that is being created uh, when it comes to to creating content. You have a few people that are doing you know, their own content, but you do also have a lot of people who are sort of falling into, I feel, I might be completely wrong, but I feel like they're falling into this trap of like, just just create so that I can show because it is so easy to create. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. Yes, yes. And of course, like the thing is, you're right. Like, you know, Megascans is a great thing, but when everyone looks like Megascans and it's just going to like, looks like everyone looks like Megascans. I have the same problem. You know, honestly speaking, ZBrush is an incredible tool, but pretty much every creature looks like a ZBrush creature. They all look the same. Right. There's all the same yep. lizard characters and they, they every single creature looks the same. And it's not necessarily ZBrush's fault is that, that that's the easiest thing to do, to look. right? Yep. And then like every piece of architecture, you know this is as well, just looks like it was made out of SketchUp, you know? And it's yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, especially, especially, yeah, very true. It's just a bunch yeah, of boxes yeah. and they all look like like SketchUp drawings, right? So, yeah, so and is. so when you and you don't necessarily when you let the tool sort of dictate what you do and you can make it really easy. Exactly but it. what if you yeah. don't want a mega scans project? Don't write your plot around mega scans because then everything's gonna look like mega scans, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You mega yeah, scans is well, great and should be used as a resource. Amazing. But, no, everything yeah. that everything in real has is amazing. You know, the meta humans, oh my god, can you imagine? Yeah, you know, and everything's every, gonna look all, like meta humans. Offer, you know, even, you know, you guys are doing it too with the library that, you know, it, it's great that all those resources, I wish those resources were there, you know, years ago, because I mean, right. A, the amount of saving that you could have money monetarily and time-wise, modern and all that yep. stuff, it's, it's immense. But it just is sort of that tale of, you know, the art should never be you know, dictated by the technology, right? The technology is there to support the art. But isn't that an opportunity, Carlos? Because if everyone's doing the same thing and someone does something that looks different, that's the thing that's going to stand out, right? So it's your opportunity. It is. Yeah, to, of course. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I agree. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Completely agree. Um, now, I guess the other thing, scaling wise, right? Uh, which is sort of it, the 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 thought always goes tied to, you know, I'm working now with, uh, as you know, with. Uh, I, uh, with a company called Happy Mushroom, where mm -hmm. I'm supervising a uh, a feature film, um, an unannounced Marvel project, mm -hmm. and it was, it's you start thinking about, you need to hire people that know the technology, but they also have a sensibility of film VFX. It's not you, you know we're getting into a, sp a space where it's no longer, you know let's just hire some. Um, some great CG generalist and a character guy and a couple of great lighters. Now you need to hire people who understand games, commercials, and film all at the same time. Yep. Right? That know how to use Unreal Engine in a proper way so that they can create tools and do things. And without education, I mean, at the rate of things are moving, it's not, you know, it's, it's I mean, it's been three years since this whole RTX thing came out, right? It was three mm -hmm. years? Yeah. That's nothing. Wow. That's that's yeah. no time, right? You know, so so then how do you transfer like everyone who's doing these great things with the available content? How do you then transfer those people to not to sound, you know, not to sound boring, but how do you translate, you know, to transplant them to a production, you know, a production studio where right. things will run or be a little different? Well, I think it's you know what's also interesting, and Carlos, you 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 would. Notice because you, you you know when you started the the uh, to talk about your what inspired you a lot of what you said was storytelling right which I think yes. is a very important thing, and I think it's interesting a lot of people don't realize that architects love good stories right <laughs> that's part of that's you know um, when you're just to give people who are not architects an idea when you are a good architect you can tell a great story about the piece of architecture that is not yet built and that's right. what sells people on what it does right so that's the part of your <laughs> skill set is to verbally express nuances that are visually represented which is a kind of an interesting uh, uh process of, of thinking about things and right. that's why we get obsessed with stories one of the things that I think has happened in the last few years in filmmaking is that there's been obviously a lot of things have centered around the, uh, um, in terms of how you plan for how a movie looks is centers around concept art and around previs, yep. right? And previs 
is short concept art <laughs> in some ways. Much, yeah. You have to sell every shot like it's one thing, right? And you see a film and you see a big, you know, big budget film these days and it just looks like hunt lots of beautiful pieces of concept art. There's not necessarily a cohesive narrative that flows through the whole thing because every That's frame amazing. is this and that and that and that. When you go to real time, the way that you were describing what you were describing, describing the experience of let's just start shooting and it doesn't yeah. matter what it looks like, I can start telling my story before the concept art. <laughs> yeah. Right? That liberates you and it starts to focus on story instead of the concept art. And I think that's something that's very interesting. I mean, do you think that that's going to change the, f the filmmaking and the priorities that people have? <laughs> I think so, but I think there's two levels to that. Um, okay. The, the the one thing which you know you you put it beautifully, but the one only thing I will add to that is with architecture, when you're designing a building, you're designing frames. You right. Are. You're, as you know, like an architect is is trying to control is a control freak trying to control people <laughs> through a building, mm -hmm. and you're saying walk through here, and this is what you're going to see, mm -hmm. and walk through here, and you, this is you know I'm 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 restricting your vision. It's kind of like framing a shot, right? So yep. I think that's the other relationship I see a lot with between architecture and, and film. Um, when it comes to the storytelling, like right now I'm working on, on for the short film, I, I'm, I'm doing one of the environments, is a greenhouse uh, in, inside this spaceship. And typically you will say, okay, I'll, we have some storyboards, but there's only a couple of vignettes. So you say, typically I will do a very quick, rough model do some previous, figure out what I need to model so I don't waste time, right? Like, like do all the due diligence of, you know, the, the, the cascade system, right? You know, the... Mm -hmm. the yeah, like, the waterfall approach. The waterfall, <laughs> sorry, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so instead of doing that, I'm like, no, wh why am I going to do that? I'm just going to model the whole thing to as much detail as I can. I'm going to have yeah. an entire greenhouse that is completely finished as if it was a set. And I'll worry about the cameras later. I'll worry about yeah. where the action happens because... I'll be able to move anywhere. And you guys had on the uh, on your other podcast, uh, uh, Sheely. Uh, Eric Sheely? Oh, yeah, oh, the Mo Martini Giant one? Martini Giant. <laughs> yeah. In the last one, you guys were talking about Moon. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and Moon is one of those movies that struck me uh, for similar reasons that you guys were talking uh, on, on the podcast. But, but one of the things that I remember uh, Duncan Jones talking about was he didn't want to have a big CG movie because then he wouldn't be able to frame the shots. So what did he do? He built an entire space station. Right. You know, the whole space station was built and he built, you know, fake panels and trap doors so he could- Low budget too. <laughs> yeah, low, but he had, he had a playground, right? And then he mm -hmm. put the cameras in there. Yeah. Um, and that's, it shows in the movie because the movie has this narrative through, through, through the space station. Yep. I don't know if that's ever going to happen on big films, big budget films, because there's so many people, so many more people involved. But maybe there isn't going to be. I mean, maybe big budget films are not as necessary, right? I'm just not not trying not trying it to say be. anything. No, it could be, yeah. You know, we're 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 basically, you know, you you were you built an entire. Just think about it this way: you built an entire greenhouse, right? That greenhouse can sit on your hard drive for years and you can just open it back up and it's just as good and fresh as it was before, Correct. right? So you don't have to sit there and say, okay, I built the greenhouse and then I have a limited time to actually shoot this greenhouse. You can shoot it anytime you want to. So right. it kind of liberates you in a lot of ways, uh, which is kind of a nice thing. Um, and you can save that for another greenhouse for some other scenes or whatever yeah. it is, you know? You can, yeah. Uh, so so there's, something, there's something about the the real time aspect that that's good um it is no it's 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 positive like i guess the thing with the big f and, and this is something that i've been experiencing for the past that i've been not experiencing i've been noticing is that if everything goes real time you're you're asking it's okay for a, maybe a low budget film right mm -hmm. to ask a low budget film in a production to say completely forget about everything that you know about the process and think about it differently. Think about it in real time. Now, you tell that to a big, large production, and you're telling our department and VFX and props and custom, all at custom design, all at the same time, hey, we can, we can get half of the stuff done in pre-production. Right. Like, you guys have the designs ready? 
we, we can build it already and we can like put it in a wall, you know, in an yep. LED wall. And, you know, but that's not going to happen because those designs don't happen until like two weeks, you know, I don't know, finalize until two weeks before right. shooting. And then that's but there's going to be a, I think that those studios are going to eventually have to change. They have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because someone else is going to do something really incredible and it's going to get a lot more attention on people's world. You know, when it's always that moment when someone does, and this is going to happen, it's, it's probably already happening now, but someone will do something like I've never seen anything like that before. Right. And that's, then that's what it's going to be. And it happened in ArcVis, right? You know this yep. very specifically. When Alex Roman went oh, and did his, yeah. he the, did his, beautiful his short. you know, he did that. It changed architecture visualization forever. Ever yep. since then, and still to this day, people it do. It looks great. No, they, people imitate that style oh, yeah, still yeah. to this day. And that was almost you know 20 years ago or whenever it was. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, that was a, a beautiful, that was a beautiful short. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that's the thing, right? Because no one had ever seen anything like that. Never knew that was possible. <laughs> yeah, and they did that. So I think that that's what's going to change. And then when some when some studio, you know, maybe it's your studio, does something really <laughs> cool, and and they're like, oh crap, this is real. Because people, I you know, I don't, I don't want to knock it too much, but I've been seeing a lot of people have been doing some real time stuff out there. It looks okay. <laughs> I mean, not. It looks okay. It looks right. like a video game. It doesn't look that, and it doesn't mean that it, it, I'm not blaming the tools. I'm saying that they, they haven't pushed it further. And just like we were talking that's about. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, going back to architecture or design or, you know, anything, you know, you design something, it right. could be industrial design. You might have to design that one th object, you know, a hundred times. And you probably right. started from scratch those a scratch those a hundred times, right? So there's right. there's always this this sort of critical eye of like this is not good enough, you know. In my case, I have myself, which I will, you know, get to a threshold. But then I have my wife, who's a producer, and she'll look right. at something, and she'll say, oh, "It looks fake." Go, right. What do you mean, looks fake? You know, it looks horrible. You know, and right. so you need to have that critical eye that of yep. not fall in love with. I had a uh, an architecture teacher the, that he he would always say. You know, because architecture is about designing. You know, you start with these crazy concepts. You know, my building is going to be a fish. You right. know, and, and you're going <laughs> to turn the fish into a building, right? Right. Um, and he would always say, because he could tell when you would do that, he would always say, "Don't fall in love with the design. Don't fall in love with the imagery, because once right. you fall in love with the imagery, that's when you stop questioning your 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 actions. Yep. You need to like walk away from it." Look at it from you know a mile away, yep. and and look at it fresh as if you've never seen it before. Because if you yep. fall in love with it, that's it, you're doomed. Yeah, it was interesting. I had a similar conversation. So one of my uh, one of the guys, uh, uh, one of my supervisors at DD, his name was Eric Barba, and he came from Art Center, uh, um, and uh, he he you know did industrial design and things of that nature there. And I came from architecture school. I went to Rice University, as you know, right. and so he used to push this thing. Like he had this narrative. It's like, you know, my, prof one of my teachers had taught me about this block of wood and you're supposed the, the, and you're supposed to turn this into some design with this block of wood. And it's all about, uh, craftsmanship. You craft and craft and craft and craft until you've perfected whatever it is that's coming out of your mind. Right. And so his thing was take the same thing and just keep crafting and crafting and crafting. And I said, it's interesting you say that because I came from architecture school and I was like, at some point you have to say, that's not working. Throw it away and start over. <laughs> exactly. That's, and that's, that's if you don't fall in love with it, yeah. then you're able to do that, I think. <laughs> and, that's, and I think that's maybe why things look to... And I, I'm, I'm also struggling with this myself, right. which is everything's, you know... There, and again, there's, the, the positives outweigh the negatives, right? So we're just sure. talking here about, you know, little things that, you know... You know, it's it's not. Again, I'm not knocking it. You know, and just sort of noticing these things. Right. But one thing that I'm struggling with is sort of like there's sort of this peer pressure that has been created to to create real time work at at the at the speed of light, which is like just just create and post. Like if if Unreal Five comes out and within three days you haven't done a test scene and put it in LinkedIn, you know. <laughs> You feel like someone has beat you to it. And like, oh my God, my life's, you know, like it's, everyone's wow. rushing a thing too much to it, right? And and 
it's sort of this it's it's this catch 22 because you you get involved in it right like oh my god it looks amazing i can do that right yeah you get sucked up in the hype you get sucked up in it yeah and yeah. And, and i think that maybe drives some of that mm-hmm. when people are they become in love with it and then they just put it out there yeah. right yeah it's yeah. interesting well, listen. I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, make you go too long. So, uh, before we before we we settle in, can you tell people where people can find your work? Where can people can check out some of the stuff you've done, and you know what people are going to be looking forward to? Obviously, find out about your new short coming out. So that's going to be great. But tell us yeah. a little bit about where they can get this information. Yeah. So the work you can find it at, at playyardstudios.com. That's uh, mm-hmm. playyard with one Y instead of two. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sorry, my kids are again. Guys, that's okay. Please. Please, please. Excuse me. No, please. Yeah. Hey, no iPad tomorrow. No. See, that always works. <laughs> uh, please. Tomorrow we can play iPad. Okay, no iPad Saturday. Um, let me start again. So you you can find you can find our work at playyourstudios.com. Mm-hmm. Um, we update it as as often as we can. Yep. Um, the short hopefully will be done by September. We're yep. trying to get it done before the the submissions for the short films. Yep. And um, and maybe there'll be all this stuff that we're working on. You know, this there for the past couple of years. Everything is there. Okay. Uh, and then you know we're like I said, I'm working on some stuff for Happy Mushroom. Yep. Uh, for a very exciting project. Um, sorry, that's okay. that's just the way it's gonna be in the it's background okay. there. <laughs> Yeah. And where can people find the Lair's book? Is that available to yeah, people? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the Lair book's available. Um, I think uh, Simon and Schuster is uh, okay. uh, um, uh, distributing it. But okay. It's available in uh, Amazon, I think uh, Kmart, like every website, you know, Target it. has it. Um, sure. It's a great book. It's a beautiful book. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's got some beautiful, a beautiful look to it. It was beautifully designed black. It was it's black pages with silver drawings um nice so yeah it's, it's a really really great book if, if if you're into that sort of thing yeah absolutely and i think people will basically you know uh we'll put all of these links uh on the page so just go to you know just go to the cg garage uh page on uh, at chaos.com and you'll be able to uh get all of that information and we'll put everything in there so all the links will be on the show pages so they'll have that which is awesome well carlos thank you so much for doing this Always a great conversation with you. Great to hear all that stuff. And, uh, you know, it's good good chatting. Thanks so much no, for sharing thank you so all this much. stuff. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it was an honor. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for making the time. <laughs> <laughs>